Welcome back to Computer Science E75. So this is lecture one where we actually dive into PHP and all things dynamic uh, websites. Um, it's been a couple of weeks now. I thought we'd perhaps begin with a couple of refreshers or at least to relay the foundation for what we're going to be dabbling in really the whole semester. And why don't we start at the beginning, which is HTTP. So we're not going to, we're going to take for granted that there's DNS. We're going to take for granted now that there's TCP IP and there's this way of getting stuff from point A to point B. But now we're going to talk about actually implementing the stuff that's going across the wire. And the protocol we're going to rely on all semester is going to be HTTP, uh, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And what does or what did this mean exactly? What is HTTP besides the prefix that's been in front of every URL you've ever typed? What's that? A daemon. OK, so HTTPD is the daemon. So, and we'll actually talk in some detail about that tonight. So those of you with a Linux background might have actually seen or played with this on one of your own servers. The D in most Linux processes or Linux binaries means it's a daemon, which means it's a server, which is, just means it's software that implements this protocol called HTTP. So let's first keep the focus on here, the protocol. What does HTTP do? Uh, sorry? Translate. Translate what? Uh, OK. Uh, OK, let me, a uh, good attempt, but not quite. Yeah. yeah it's a protocol for, for uh, either sending or, or, or getting uh, pages from uh, the web server. Yeah, good. So it's a protocol, it's a language, it's a set of standards that dictates how web browsers talk to web servers and how the latter reply to the former. So a protocol in general in computer speak is gener it is a language, but usually it's simpler than that. It's just a set of standards. For instance, we humans, at least in this country, tend to have a protocol whereby if you walk into a room, sit down next to someone in a class, you turn to the left and you say, hi, my name is so-and-so, and you shake hands. So we have this sort of stupid protocol where we do this up and down, and it's just kind of what humans do. Well, similarly, do computers do things similar? And in fact, in TCP, there's actually a three-way hand shake, uh, which is perhaps a, a coincidental uh, pun there. But in the world of HTTP, there's just a set of standards that web server and browser follow when one wants to talk to the other. And what do we mean by that? Well, if we've got web browser on the left and web server on the right, and there's a user driving the thing on the left, the user types in like CNN.com and hits Enter. And that was a story we told in some detail two weeks ago about what happens from hitting Enter to actually seeing the day's news. But one of the pieces of that story was to say that this little web browser has a little, you know, it's wants to send a message. We'll think of it as a message on a piece of paper. It's going to shove that piece of paper ultimately in a virtual envelope of sorts. And again, last week we talked about what's on the envelope, IP address, return IP address, all of that. But what's inside the envelope is a message that, you know, quite simply is something like get. What do you want to get? You know, I want to get the root of the hard drive on the web server, get the file called index.html. And I got to leave myself a little more room because what HTTP also says is that the next thing you should do being the client, is inform the server you know, what version of HTTP you're speaking, just in case humans go and update it so that the servers can distinguish one, product, one version from the other. So there's a few more pieces of data that flow across the wire, but really this is the juiciest one. And this will actually be diagnostically useful as you dive into project one, two, and three, because it'll actually help to sniff your own traffic and see what strings are you actually sending across the wire. Because besides just hard coding in file names like this, what also can be sent in via this so-called get string? Yeah. Uh, so images, so yes, we can get binary data back. But if we focus just on this ASCII string here, what more can I, the web browser, communicate to the server just by way of this basic line? Anything jumping out at folks? So parameters. So we'll see today in particular there, there's at least two ways that a browser can submit information to a web server. It can either go in the URL, and when you do that, you are using the get standard, or it can kind of be hidden, and that's what we call post usually. And you post usually sensitive things like passwords, credit card information, or big binary files. But get is also useful. And what we'll see, in fact, especially now that we're dabbling in dynamic websites where it's not a uh, it's not a static file like index.html we're waiting for, but something like foo 
dot php. Well, we can influence the behavior of foo dot php by passing in some parameters. And we'll see today in great detail that the standard is that after the file name you're requesting, you put a question mark, and then you put a set of key value pairs, where the key is something like x equals y. And if you need another one, it's then, as you've probably seen on the real web, uh, ampersand uh, uh, z equals w. And then that pattern repeats. And then does the browser say, oh, by the way, we should speak HTTP 1.1 or whatever the version is. So this, in short, is a get string. Yeah? Mm -hmm. No, so this is a web thing. So this is an HTTP thing. Sending parameters across the wire are encoded by way of a question mark followed by the key value pairs. And each key value pair is separated by ampersands. We'll see over time a couple of PHP uh, specific things. For instance, and just as a teaser, if you uh, find yourself this semester, probably for project one, implementing uh, like a select menu or check boxes, so all of which are somehow related. Anytime you want the user to submit multiple values for something, as you can with like a multiple select menu, PHP's slightly stupid convention, to be honest, is if the, uh, uh, the field you want to submit is called foo, it actually encodes it as foo ampersand, uh, open bracket, close bracket equals x, for instance. And then you have ampersand foo open bracket, close bracket equals y. And what PHP does on server side, as we'll experience ourselves, is if PHP ever sees a parameter name, parameters these things are called, with these open brackets, no numbers or anything inside of them, and it sees it again and again, what it will hand you, the programmer, is in fact an array with all of those values. This is a minor, uh, frankly an aesthetically ugly thing that PHP chose to do. There, would have, there could have been smarter ways of doing this. But that's PHP specific. Most everything we'll do today early on is very much just web standards, web-based. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, I mean, does uh, the number of parameters or the parameters name influence in any way the speed at which the page can be sent back to the browser? It's a good question. So does the, do the length or number of parameters influence the speed of this transaction? So sort of. So it can absolutely influence the speed of the gets, uh, the request, and the response. Because the more data you send, obviously, the more bits you have to send. And given a finite uh, bandwidth speed, um, sure, the more bits you want to send, the slower it's going to be. But frankly, as we'll see in a moment when I do a quick demo, there's so much other crap that gets sent across the wire that having a few more uh, parameters really doesn't add up all that significantly. But if we're actually implementing a site like Flickr or Facebook where we're uploading binary data, absolutely, the bigger the content that you're uploading, the longer it's going to take. So, all right, so yeah. I was hoping someone should ask that. So yes, but it's not standardized. So as we will see, the means by which people generally implement get strings is just with basic hyperlink. So most everyone in the room probably has some HTML background, and you've done open bracket a href equals quote unquote. Anything you put in the quotes there is going to be requested just by definition by way of get. And we'll see this in a moment. The browser will generate a little something like this, send it to the server. So that then begs the question or reduces this question to, well, what's the longest URL you can visit? Unfortunately, there's no standard there. So the rule of thumb, if you kind of Google around and look at empirical tests people have done on IE and Firefox and Chrome, is that 1,024 characters in a URL is safe. Maybe 2048 is safe. Technically, some browsers, I think Firefox, support like 65,000 characters in the URL. But you can imagine you know, the email forward you get when someone's pasted a URL that long. They break you know, after 80 characters, usually. Never mind things that are this big. But the rule of thumb is that if you start pushing the limit of comfort, like a few dozen parameters or a few hundred characters, probably time to switch to post, which isn't ideal, especially since it makes it harder for people to send bookmark things and send emails with URLs. But it's unfortunately no uh, steadfast rule. All right, so let's simulate this. And again, uh, one of the lessons from last week was that uh, you are quite welcome to use any browser you want for development, um, though we do expect that you test your code rigorously with at least two. But frankly, <coughs> Firefox is really going to be your friend when it comes to implementing uh, stuff this semester, I would say, just becomes, because it comes with such a rich set of tools, one of which is this thing called uh, Live HTTP Headers. So if you don't recall this from two weeks ago or haven't done it yourself, fun at-home exercise is go home, download Firefox, the latest if you don't have it, go to the course website, 
go to software, and on the course website, what you will see is a bunch of links. And one of whose categories is Firefox add ons. And frankly, if you just kind of spend a couple minutes, install all these at the start of the semester, you'll find them wonderful tools in your toolkit.、Uh, what we have up here is one called Firebug, which I might use a little bit tonight.、Um, JavaScript debugger will eventually use. Live HTTP headers will use a lot. Show IP is only minorly interesting if you're. If your website is hosted by more sites than just one,、uh, Web Developer, though, is wonderfully useful, especially for stupid, useful things like simulate a window that's 800 pixels by 600 or simulate 1024 by 768. You like, click, click, done. There's no futzing around and dragging and trying to guess or the worst. What I used to do is change your whole monitor's resolution, which then screws up like, all the icons on your desktop. <laughs> And it's just then on a 30 inch screen, your website looks atrocious, but it at least simulated it pretty darn accurately. And then, why slow is actually something from Yahoo that is really useful diagnostically, sort of for the final mile. Like, once you're looking over your site, you're happy where it's at, then you can really shoot down your spirit by seeing just how poorly you implemented it all by looking at some benchmarks as to how well it performs. But what that tool does is it suggests some optimizations. Like, maybe you should. Compress your JavaScript. Maybe you should merge these files into one and other crazy things. So,、um, we'll use live HTTP headers for the moment. Let me go back and open that window. I'm going to put it slightly to the side. And notice it already got filled with a bunch of stuff because just visiting the course's website actually triggered a whole bunch of HTTP requests. And it's funny, our website is probably fairly conservative with the number of requests we make. If you go to CNN.com or any news site that have advertisements and flash content and、uh, graphics, you'll see so much stuff go across the wire. And the world has just gotten sloppy overall. So the world has gotten、uh, ambitious, wanting to make their websites as dynamic. As possible, outsourcing ads to third party companies. But you start to feel it, frankly, if you have a phone like this one or Blackberry or whatever that's got a browser, because then you really start to feel the price、uh, that we need to pay in order to make 20 different HTTP requests. And I think we saw that last week with Firebug. I think even our own website triggered like 19 requests, which is relatively low. We then did CNN, and I think it was like 90 something requests. So, an interesting question to consider in your own website is you know, how can you implement even this simple project more efficiently? Because the more mobile people are coming, you know, these kinds of issues are coming back to bite us or to motivate us. So, with that said, let me go to google.com,、uh, enter. A whole bunch of stuff happened even for Google, but let me scroll up and focus on the first. So, here's how this tool is useful. So, one, it reminds you of the URL you just typed in in the very top line. Two, it then shows you what the corresponding get request was. So, going to the default、uh, base directory of a, of a URL, google.com, just gets you forward slash, and that is in fact consistent with what I'm seeing up here. So, below this is some stuff, most of which is kind of tedious to look through, and we'll just glance at it but not dwell. But we'll come back to this line, host colon google.com, because that's hugely valuable.、Uh, what is this third line representing for those familiar? Yeah, the browser. So the world has kind of standardized a set of strings that each browser vendor and browser version sends across the wire. It's by no means prerequisite. In fact, people who are really paranoid can even strip this information out relatively easily. You can simulate it fairly easily. For instance, another good tool. That I downloaded at some point from Apple's site is this develop. Actually, I didn't even download it. I think there's a hidden feature in Safari, and Google is your friend. I forget how I enabled it, but I enabled the develop menu in Safari 4. And among the things you can do is go to the user agent submenu. And you can change what browser you are currently masquerading as, which is actually useful if you want to simulate iPhone development, web based iPhone development, just within your browser. But what this means, if it's not already clear, is you can't trust the user agent string. Like you can use it for statistical purposes when analyzing your web traffic and all of this, but you shouldn't necessarily you shouldn't write code. I would say, in principle, that requires that this information be provided because it may not be accurate. It might be scrubbed. Proxies can certainly strip this kind of information out for efficiency or privacy. Just realize that feature may very well be there. All right, so what else is over here? Let me zoom back in.、Um, accept. What, what does this mean precisely? This fourth line here that begins with accept colon. Yeah? 
Yeah, exactly. This is just a comma separated list of file types the browser is willing to receive in response to this request. So, not where you'll rarely, if ever, spend time on that. This is some what language do you want to expect? So, it's giving the server a hint that give me English. But realize, too, I can clearly visit like, other countries' websites. And even though I'm saying I speak English, it doesn't matter. They can still send back whatever they want. So, realize this metadata isn't necessarily governing the behavior of the recipient. But then this one's interesting, except in coding. What is gzip? Sorry? Zip files, and not PC zip files, GNU zip, or I think that's where the G came from in this context.、Um, it's a Linux thing. So gzip is a Linux or a Unix tool, identical in spirit to what was pkzip on the Windows platform and Macs now have. But yeah, it's a compression、uh, algorithm. That,、uh, what this means then is that the browser is willing to talk to the server using compression. So, this is actually nice, and this is one of those things these days that it's so easy to turn on. One line in a configuration file, the file we'll discuss tonight, means you can start saving bytes really easily with, no, with relatively little cost.、So、the fact that we now have.、Um, maybe outside. It's funny because these are all like undergraduate dorms right outside, so I don't know what is going on.、Um, for those on camera, there's a baby somewhere nearby. Um, so, where was I?、Um, oh, so what this line here is, except in coding, is the browser's way of saying this to the server hey, why don't we save some bytes? I am willing to do decompression if what you send me back is in fact compressed. And because web servers today, computers in general, have gigahertz CPUs, 2 gigahertz, 3 gigahertz, like bandwidth tends to be more of the bottleneck these days than pure CPU capabilities. So it's really easy and relatively cheap for two servers, browser and server. Uh, to just do that compression. And you get it for free, essentially. Now, if you're dealing millions of hits per day, billions of hits per day, maybe you want to rethink subtleties like this. But for the typical person,、um, turn it on. It's a good thing. All right, what else? So then there's some character set stuff. Keep alive, how many seconds to actually maybe keep this connection alive. And then there's some cookie information. So we'll actually come back to that as our PHP gets more sophisticated. And the,、uh, the tragedy is, after all this effort, all of this information my browser just provided, the server pretty much said, go away. The, the URL you requested has moved permanently. Now, what URL did I visit exactly? So, I visited google.com, and if we want to get really anal, I didn't visit a URL. I got lazy, I typed google.com, enter. The browser,、so, uh, Firefox in this case, automatically prepended http colon slash slash and appended forward slash at the end. So, everything that I just described, http colon slash slash google.com slash, that is a syntactically valid URL. Unfortunately, it leads to a near dead end because Google tells me, sorry, our website has moved permanently to what URL? www.google.com. So, this location field is actually among two, the relatively few headers that we will find hugely valuable this semester because it apparently provides a mechanism for servers to tell users, browsers, to go elsewhere. Now, it's not showing me a generic message that says, hey, David, go here instead. It's telling me just by way of these headers. So, what is my browser probably doing with this info? Because Google did, in fact, come up successfully. It's hitting, sitting here in the background for me. So, my browser did what upon receipt of that? Exactly. So, the browser is smart enough to do things recursively. So, if the browser, upon parsing these headers, sees, oh,、uh, uh, HTTP code 301, that means redirect. I'm going to take it upon myself to go fetch that URL that's in the location header. On behalf of the user. Now, you can do very bad things easily, and even I am guilty many, many times of creating infinite loops between one website and another, usually because of some typo that I've made in a config file that we'll also discuss tonight. Because you can imagine redirecting Google to www.google.com and then that one to that one, really bad things happen, and kind of the internet melts down, or at least your browser stops responding,、um, which is probably better. So, what else is in there? Well, let's see.、Uh, content type, kind of uninteresting, date. OK, expires, getting a little more interesting. Cache control. So we'll see too that now that you're implementing dynamic websites with PHP, you kind of have to be more sensitive to issues of caching. Because if the whole point of your site, 
anything that's dynamic, whether it's Facebook or any website that's got to provide different content, you need to be able to ensure that when you present the user a new page, it is in fact the current view of that page and not left to their browser's discretion to just, eh, let me show you this person's Facebook profile from five minutes ago. Because, right, in Facebook, that would really freak people out if their Facebook profile's got five minutes out of date. So there's got to be a way for the server to tell the browser something like, don't cache this because odds are it's going to change soon. So back in the day, this was great, especially for lots of sites that ended, whose file names ended in .html, because odds are those were not being updated nearly as often. So caching is more of a concern in here, too. You're going to start banging your heads for one of the first time against browser differences. Essentially, to tell browsers not to cache pages, we're going to have to copy and paste a whole bunch of lines that empirically, when you try them all, tend to work on all possible browsers. There's no one silver bullet that tells all browsers everywhere, don't cache this page. So even here, too, Google has used the expires header, and it's also used cache control. And we'll see yet others like Pragma, which are even more discouraging. Google, at least, relatively infrequently changes its home page, though. Although, I don't know if you've all gotten this. Sometimes they do it on a per cookie basis. They've changed their buttons lately, their font size. Some stuff has gone on. Still kind of ugly, but still, uh, still simple. All right, so what happens next? That's just one request response. Well, let's scroll down. Well, here is the request, the third transaction here. That's for the official URL. Uh, the rest of the stuff's kind of the same as last time. Oh, and this is good. So this is one of those error mess or codes that you never see, and that's a good thing. So you've probably all seen HTTP 404. What does that mean? File not found. Probably not your fault, probably someone else's, but it means the web page has moved and no one fixed the link somewhere. 404, uh, there's 401. Forbidden file permissions, like you didn't shamat it correctly or it's not world readable or executable, something like that. Uh, 500, this is a bad one. Server error, which is such a useless error because you have to really chase it down by way of server logs or trial and error. You tend not to see that with PHP. You saw it all the time with like Perl, or at least I did with my code. Um, but you will see it if you misconfigure a .ht access file, which is a config file we'll talk about tonight. That's the easiest way to generate it in our context. But 200 means what? What went wrong? Yeah, nothing. So 200 is good. So here, too, it's useful to look underneath the hood. And there's dozens more of these, most of which we, for the course, won't care about. Um, but some of them, you know, if you get sort of bored one day or you're curious to really distinguish valid, requests from in, uh, valid responses from invalid ones, this can be a useful thing. So let's see what its response was. Whoops, scroll too fast. So the response that came back from the server here uh, was OK. So what was returned exactly in this request response? Sorry? Uh, so, zero, uh, uh, where are you seeing this? I'm not seeing oh, you're not. So, uh, so, realize live HTTP headers just shows headers. So, we're not seeing the content. So, back in the browser window, just in real world terms, what was returned? So, the, the content, right? The index.html page or index.whatever they're index.php, default.asp, whatever they're using. So, we don't see that here. It was returned, but my god, look at what happened after that. If I zoom out and go, whoops, I closed it by accident. Let me just do a refresh to re-simulate the same thing. So we, this was the original request. We were told to, well, uh, uh, small white lie, I, the browser remembered that I was told that it moved permanently. So notice when I and when I reload it, I'm already at this URL. So we've lost one transaction here, but that's OK. So here's the 200. But look at all of the stuff that's gone across the wire. What is all of this? I only have one browser window open. Yeah, so there's at least one image, this big Google logo here. There may be some JavaScript or CSS. But long story short, and this was nothing, those number of requests that run across the wire, anytime you visit a page that has things like image source or script source or uh, link href for CSS and all of these things. Each of those induces, unfortunately, yet another HTTP request. So for every URL that needs to be slurped down to be embedded in the web page, the browser needs to make another HTTP request. And if you've ever wondered, if you do have smartphones of some sort with browsers, why things are kind of slow sometimes? I mean, just look at the overhead, right? This is Google. There's really very little content. But look at just all of the metadata that was sent across the wire just to get that page here. And if we look at the source code for Google, it's fairly minimalist, but it, it certainly compressed these days. 
a lot of it's white space, but I mean, relatively, uh, relative to the HTTP overhead, it's kind of a lot. So that's expensive, all of these headers. Yeah? Both, so it alternates. So how do you, how do you distinguish when the, in, in what you're showing us? How can I distinguish what the browser was composing versus what the server was returning in the in your? Yep, uh, it's relatively easy. So the first one is going to be from the browser because the server can't contact you proactively. Wow. So it just alternates, to be honest. And what the program does is you can't really see it on this overhead. There's a thin dashed line that separates each pair. So uh, you can kind of see it. Where my arrow is, there's a dashed line. So in between every pair of dashed lines, there's request, response, request, response, request, response. Okay, so Purely alternating. Line line mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. That's all. Blank line between the two, and that's it. Just alternates. OK. So so we saw a mention, though, of uh, keep alive there for a moment ago. Let's see. Yeah, keep alive 300 seconds. So thankfully, one of the things HTTP 1.1 did was it implemented this, this ability to keep alive. So those of you who have some networking background might know that we have HTTP here, and then we have TCP, then there's IP, then there's Ethernet. Like There's a lot of metadata that the world has relied on for years to get data from point A to B. It's even worse. If making an HTTP request from browser to server requires not only sending all of these headers from browser to server and then back, but also then closing the TCP connection and then reopening a TCP connection, because again, to, to play on words from earlier, there is this three-way TCP handshake, which for our purposes just means yet more bits have to go across the wire just to start talking to the server. So one of the nice things that the newer version of HTTP brought was the ability to make multiple requests via HTTP over the same TCP socket connection. So in other words, the browser opens a TCP IP connection to the server, which means it now has this pipe, so to speak, through the internet across which it can send bits. All of those bits relate to HTTP, but it doesn't have to constantly do this, 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 because every act of my hands moving apart and together would have cost us yet more bits in time. So that's a good thing. And in fact, what you can even do, uh, this is in fact a server-side connection, telling the server maintain persistence. So in the interest of scalability, when we talk in particularly about this later in the semester, just toggling little configuration options, which tend to be relatively easy, can give you huge performance gains. And we'll see that in the context of database connections too. When we start using MySQL, from PHP code, the default case generally is going to be for your PHP code to run, uh, connect to the database, kill the connection if you need it again. Again, da 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 da. It's just a lot of overhead, so you can turn on quote unquote persistent connections for databases too. Okay, any questions about the kinds of bits that are going across the wire here? Most of these are relatively similar in spirit. See, there's Google's logo going across the wire. Yeah. Um, so I've heard that if you um, put images or source to the images in CSS, mm -hmm. it would save bits. But if it takes bits to get the CSS file, are you really saving? So it depends. People have uh, so questions about using uh, putting images in CSS to load them instead of just embedding in the raw file. So that tends to do more with sort of clever tricks, knowing how browsers behave. In fact, another common trick that I'll introduce probably in a, in a future lecture, um, only because I, I want to compile some some good examples. A lot of websites that have a lot of images these days will essentially, for the sake of minimizing the number of images that need to be downloaded, and this might be exactly what you're describing. Um, people will, if their website needs to have 10 images, one's over here, one's over here, one's over here, like it's not one big image, it's like 10 small images, they will nonetheless use Photoshop or whatever to put them all in the same file, the same JPEG, GIF, or PNG, so that when the browser downloads that image, yes, it's bigger, but they download it all at once. And then using CSS and maybe some JavaScript tricks, they essentially only show the user, say, pixel number 23 to 46, and then 46 to, right? They just essentially move a little sliding window using CSS tricks and Z uh, indices sometimes and tricks like this so that you only look at part of that image. And it's increasingly common. It's a pain to do manually, I'm sure. I'm sure people are using tools for this. And it's really, frankly, I think, got to be taking the fun out of doing web development when you have to optimize to that level. But that's probably one of the tricks folks are using. Um, and it's, it's partly motivated, frankly, by stuff like this. It just gets the job done better. So 
song. Only request it once. So that's good. So the web's done that very well for a while. So if you take an image and just repeat it using HTML、uh, syntax or using CSS syntax, no problem there. It's only downloading it once. So these are tricks when people have lots of images that they ideally want to get all at once in one HTTP transaction just to, again, avoid all of this overhead, which does add up. Yeah, other questions? All right. So who is this server that we keep? Talking to.、Uh, so, Apache. So, Apache is kind of the de facto standard out there, at least in Linux environments, and for folks who are somewhat cost conscious,、um, because it works really well. It's really free. It's open source, so people can get comfort with looking at source code. They can even troubleshoot bugs at the low level if they really want to. And frankly, these days, there's just no need, and this is not at all, I'm fairly OS agnostic, but.、Um, There's just no need to pay for something like Microsoft Internet Information Server when all you want to do is host a website because you can do it all for free at very high volumes. This is known to be one of the highest performing web servers out there, and there are yet other options. And it kind of comes with every Linux installation. It comes with Mac OS X Server,、um, and we'll see too for the course that it's really easy to download even onto your own Mac, PC,、uh, or Linux box that you may have yourself. So you'll find occasionally during the semester that it's useful to consult the documentation for this, not because you're going to be doing a lot of configuration of Apache. For the most part, CS75.net gets handed to you pre configured in a fairly standard way. But we also set an option in our config file that says, let the students do most anything they want that's possible technically in your own public HTML directories. And you'll do this by way of your own custom,、uh, custom config files called .htaccess files. So, what does that mean? You'll be able to do things like Google did. If someone visits davidmalin.com and you want to standardize on www.davidmalin.com or vice versa, Few lines in a configuration file called .htaccess can, uh, can implement precisely that for you. So you can do a lot of powerful things, especially related to URL rewriting, some of which we'll introduce into the course. But I offer it now so that if in the future you're trying to do something like change all of the links on your website, to change、uh, paths or file names, or you want to change domain names, you should start thinking rewrite rules. And we'll see some of those tonight. But what's in our own config file? So we saw a line in、uh, CS75.net that I said was hugely advantageous, and that was that host line, host colon. And then it was this sort of gratuitous reminder of what website I had just requested. But that's actually really useful, because as we said two weeks ago, we have one server, a VPS for the course, and we've got like 150 students, and therefore 150 domains. So even though there are lots of IP addresses in this world, most of them have been taken already. So there's 4 billion IPs. You know, most of them are taken, such that、uh, the crazy folks sort of predict the end of the internet you know, in a year or two when they really run out. So、um, hopefully that won't happen. And we'll still be plugging away. But the means, one means by which we can mitigate that concern is let's just use the same IP address for all of us.、Right? The world has supported what's called virtual hosts for many years now. So it's pretty safe, to, it's quite safe to go with this these days for a typical site. And what virtual hosts allow us to do on a web server in the official web server's configuration is、uh, host multiple websites all on not only the same physical computer, but at the same IP address. But that then begs the question if a browser, per the story two weeks ago, I type in foo.com and hit enter,、uh, DNS gets involved, gives me back an IP address. I then put that IP address on my virtual envelope and send it to cs75.net. How in the world does the server know to give the user David's website or Sid's or Dan's or any students in the course? Well, thankfully, the browser is sending a reminder where? A little sanity check here. In that host line. So, browsers these days, because modern browsers have been written by people who realize we need to support virtual hosts, send this reminder host colon and then the name of the domain or subdomain that you typed in in the URL. Because that's the only mention in the HTTP headers of the actual domain name typed in. Anything the user typed in in the URL、uh, related to domains is otherwise gone because everything else happens at two weeks ago's level. TCP, IP, all the stuff that's all numeric, not human readable in terms of foo.com or host names. So, what's in this file? Well, this is literally excerpted from cs75.net's own、uh, httpd.conf file. 
it's kind of hard to pronounce these things, but you get familiar with them because they're fairly standardized across uh, Linux and Unix and Mac OS systems. So this is the server-wide config. Unfortunately, it can be in any number of places on your, on your own machine or on a corporate server. But common places to look for it are somewhere in slash Etsy. So where config files tend to be, but it really varies. So doing a full disk search is sometimes the easiest. So inside this file on our server is a whole bunch of code that looks like this. And it kind of looks like XML, but it's not. It's kind of a half-assed approach to making XML, but it's Apache's approach to implementing their config files. And you can kind of read it, even if you've never seen it before, top to bottom. So virtual ho here comes a virtual host. What IP address should this virtual host be defined for? Well, that IP. Whose IP is that? Well, that's one of the four that that company that we pay to host CS75.net gave us. So we hard-coded it into the file. And then what's the colon 80? Yeah, port. So 80 is the standard port for HTTP. You can override it, but that's the standard. But this is very specifically telling Apache, or HTTPD, only expect the following virtual host to come in on that port and that IP address. And if you somehow see, for DNS reasons, requests for mailinrouge.com come in on a different port or a different IP, too bad. Ignore them. So this is very specific here, but I could have done things like an asterisk and put star colon star if you don't even want to worry about that level of detail. So what else is up there? Server name. So this is important because we need to tell Apache who is this virtual host for. So let me zoom in for just a moment. So server name tells Apache what the official name is for this host. And then there's this thing here, uh, server alias. So there's a little bit of unnecessary redundancy here, because direct admin is being a little stupid by spitting out the same domain name twice. Completely not necessary, but so be it. But there is something slightly different. What's another alias for www.mailinrouge.com? So just, I hear people saying Malinrouge. Malinrouge, I just said it. Malinrouge.com. So Malinrouge.com, uh, it's OK. Uh, mailinrouge.com is an alias, a synonym for www.mailinrouge.com, which means this is the second piece of the puzzle that dictates that the web server will support either URLs of the form mailinrouge.com or www.mailinrouge.com. That's the second piece. What was the first piece from two weeks ago? What else needs to be configured properly for both of those to work? Oh, yeah, I heard it. DNS, right? Both of those entries need an IP address associated with them or a CNAME associated with them. So in other words, we must define both mailinrouge.com and www.mailinrouge.com in DNS because that means we'll associate an IP address. Maybe it's the same with both of those. That will let internet traffic get to the web server. And that's when step two kicks in. The web server has to be configured to expect traffic on both of them. Yeah. Uh, that's done on the, no, 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 not root server. This is on our server, the web server. So in the, maybe I meant the root of the hard drive or something like that. Root servers, no. Those never come into the story anymore. OK, so what else is there? So server admin. So if you've ever visited a website that has a really sort of default error message that says, like, file not found, 404, and then there's a little HR line at the bottom, and then it says, you know, webmaster at foo.com, where did that come from? It came from this file right here. So if you get those really generic error messages. It's funny, something you've seen for years, like, there's the magic. So uh, all revealed. Document root. This one's important, and you can probably infer. What is the purpose of this directive here? Exactly. So this directive, document root, it must be capitalized exactly as you see here. So you have to be careful about capitalization. That means that the website called mailinrouge.com, aka www.mailinrouge.com, is implemented by way of the files in that very long path there. Home, do, mailin, domains, mailinrouge.com slash public HTML. Now, if you've poked around your CS75.net accounts already, you realize this is actually a nice feature of direct admin. It allows individual users like yourself to have multiple domains all within the same account. So you don't need a username password for every account. But again, this is roughly arbitrary. You could put this stuff anywhere you want. All right, what else is up here? Well, we'll come back to this, but there's this thing, su, uh, su exec user group, mailin mailin, custom log, custom log. That just means where to put the logs. And we'll see in a moment where you have access to those. Uh, and then there's this, whoops, 
And then there's this、uh, directory. So inside of the virtual host, we have some sort of permissions being set here. So in, for the directory, home mailing domains, mailingrooms.com, public HTML, enable the following options all. So, when I said earlier we allow students to pretty much override anything that's technically possible, it's because we said options all in this config file. SUPHP engine on, we'll discuss in a bit what it means to actually implement things relatively securely on the server. And these are an add on we use. It's very standard, it's very free, called SUPHP, but that'll become relevant in just a moment. But for the most part, that is all direct admin had to do for me when I clicked a link on、uh, panel.cs75.net that said create domain. And it asked me a couple of questions like, what is the domain name? It then generated this file, reloaded the configuration into the server, and voila, mailinrouge.com is now there on the internet. Any questions about this config? Yeah?、Um, the concept of、uh, virtual directory. Uh huh. What do you mean by from somewhere else? Like、uh, somewhere、uh, in, in, in my C drive or D drive. Or... So. So, just to summarize, suppose you want to put all of your content in a subdirectory of, say, public HTML. So, there's a couple of、uh, very simple solutions. But one question first one, do you want XXS to appear in the URL or just on the file system? No, I want it in the URL. Okay, so in that case, it's very easy. If you want to have a subdirectory, just call it foo. I would just create inside my own public HTML directory a subdirectory called foo. I would dump all my GIFs, JPEGs, CSS files in there. And now, if I wanted to make sure that visiting www.mydomainname.com、uh, slash always redirects to XXS, then I would use these little tricks we'll see in a bit called rewrite rules that just forces any requests for just the root of the web server to automatically go to that subdirectory. So, two steps, both of which are very trivial. But she wants to keep XXS or foo or whatever in the URL itself. So we literally need the directory. And even that's a slight white lie. Using rewrite rules, which are available incidentally, not just in Apache, but many different web servers simulate the same idea, you can actually do very clever things, like is increasingly common. A lot of websites today, if you have a URL, they will often do something like foo.com slash bar. But bar is not actually a directory. It's not even a file. Even I've actually begun doing this in sites I make. I will generally have a file called bar.php. But as a matter of style and a matter of flexibility, if I ever want to change the language that I've implemented the site in, I actually hide most of my file extensions these days very simply with a little .ht access file, which again we'll discuss. Just because, one, this looks a little cleaner. Two, it saves me four bytes with every request, which frankly don't need to be spent anyway. And three, if I ever do change to Java or something else, I don't have to worry as much about changing all my URLs around. So, a couple of tips then for Apache. Generally, on a server,、uh, you, the owner of the server, would do something like go into,、uh, let me do this. So, var log httpd and then access.、Uh, So, I can't see it as a user, but it would usually be called access log or it would be called error log. But because we have hundreds of people all on the same server, we don't want to just give everyone access to the same files because then you'd see somewhat private information. So, one of the nice things that Direct Admin does, which most of these panel tools do, is if I go to https colon slash slash panel.cs75.net and watch, we too are using a rewrite rule. Let me zoom in and hit enter. Oh, interesting. Has it expired again? Damn it. All right, that's a good, good teaching moment. We will explain how you renew an SSL certificate at some point. 
Uh, yeah, well, we use the certificate in two different ports, and I must not have updated it on that one. So notice that my URL has changed to port 222. We thought it would be a little lame if we had to tell you, the students, always go to https colon slash slash panel.cs75.net colon 2222. Just another thing to remember, and it's inelegant. Kind of needs to be that way because that's how direct admin works. But notice the redirection happened automatically, and that's because of a little config we did using some of today's building blocks. Unfortunately,、uh, we got tripped up by the SSL warning because that's my mistake. But let me go ahead and just log in to my sort of student account here.、Uh, direct admin, again, you won't use very often for the course. You'll use it like maybe once per project just to get yourself set up. But it's so useful, honestly,、um, just in simplifying some common tasks. I'm going to go to site summary. And notice in this interface here, there's a bunch of stuff. Frankly, I've rarely looked at all of it. But up here at the top, Notice you can see the last 10 lines, last 100 lines, or your full usage log or full error log. If you run into a problem where you're really having trouble chasing it down, or God forbid you're getting the、uh, HTTP 500 error, you kind of have to go into the logs, and they're all accessible here for you. So, another good diagnostic tool. And then also realize we will start talking about MySQL at some point. We talked two, day,、uh, two weeks ago about DNS management. You're welcome to play around with the email stuff, but it really doesn't matter if you use or don't use email for the course.、Uh, and then finally, for the most part, yeah, there's not much more that you'll need to do just to get basic websites up and running. Yeah? Send an email just playing around.、Mm-hmm. It, so it depends on the webmail tool you're using. The short of it is because、uh, direct admin did not make it very easy to correct those automatically.、Um, users can fix it by overriding your from address. It's just a silly configuration thing that, to be honest, we didn't put that much time into solving because the accounts are so short lived anyway. It's just a config thing, is all. Yeah. No, for the most part, any web hosting company these days is going to use virtual hosting because that's the only way they get economy of scale. They have a $2,000 server and they have 20 customers on it. Oh, yes. So, and it, so, yes. So, for instance, a lot of web hosts, DreamHost, for instance, is one I've used. They allow you to sign up for like 20 bucks a month, and you yourself can host multiple domains in your own account on their same server.、Um, but I'll qualify again. I, I found better、uh, hosts since then. OK, a other questions? All right, why don't we take a five minute break? That was a lot. All right, so a couple of things administrative. So, Sid, one of our teaching fellows, is going to be holding the first live section tonight. It's right after class. I know it makes for a long evening, but it at least makes for one commute.、Uh, for those of you who would like to stay,、um, it will be in room 103 of this building.、Um, and then he'll also be able to stick around afterward,、uh, since section will be one hour, for more, one on,、uh, more intimate one on one QA. And then do realize, too, that we'll have an online section using the software called Illuminate Online.、Uh, if you're not aware of the details yet, just check the website、uh, where we'll be sure to post things like that. But then, particularly, keep an eye throughout the semester on the course's bulletin board. So, we are using a tool called SMF, it's free software for、uh, forum software. Just so happens to be written in PHP, uses MySQL, but it's mostly a coincidence. What we like about it is that it's relatively simple, and it also lets us anonymize all of your names by default. So, This is to help you feel more comfortable avoiding the proverbial dumb question.、Uh, all of your names are initialized to student.、Um, we can see who you are, but fellow students cannot, so you should feel very comfortable posting questions, especially if you think everyone else is going to know the answer. But all the better if they do, because they can、uh, help us out by fielding questions. And certainly feel free to chit chat with each other, answer each other's questions, but just again, per the syllabus,、um, do respect the line between sharing too much code or too much detail versus just. Uh, helping folks out, especially with technical stuff、uh, like my installation of Apache is not working. So do take advantage of that. You can subscribe by RSS if you don't want to have to proactively check and just have stuff、uh, pulled into your favorite RSS reader.、Uh, all right, so let's show what you can actually do with an HT access file. So if I have m a y l i n r o u g e c o m and I simply want to redirect、uh, m a y l i n r o u g e c o m to www or vice versa, I can do The following. So let me go ahead and actually log into an account with which I can simulate this. 
I'll increase the font size in just a moment. So I'm literally connecting to MalinRouge.com. I'm going to go to, let's say, domains, MalinRouge.com, public HTML. And let's see, I don't maintain this all that often, except when it comes up in lectures. Let's see what I got there right now, MalinRouge.com. Lovely. So I think I pulled this up once before. This is the extent of my Photoshop abilities. Um, it looks even better when it's not so washed out on the screen. But let's see. I am at www.mailinrouge.com. So that's interesting. Let me see, because I could have sworn I just typed HTTP. Yeah, I did. I just typed that. Enter. Hmm. I got back to the www. So let me take a look. Let me increase my font size here. Notice I'm in Mailin, uh, public HTML. Let me go ahead into, yeah, interesting. So .ht access. Uh, so this is the standard. Uh, you can override this in, in Apache's httpd.conf. So this is the server-wide setting that generally you have no control over, just people like us do or the sysadmins. Um, you do have control over .ht access, but you only have the right to add directives to that. Well, rather, features will only work if that file has permitted them, as is the case in ours. So let me see what I got in here. OK, not all that much. Turns out it's pretty simple. So let's take a look at this here. Let me increase it a little more. So. Here's what it takes. In .ht access, you first, if you want to do any of this fancy URL rewriting, you first say rewrite engine on, capitalized as follows. All right. After that, I have some extra blank space. Anything with a, a, a sharp sign is a comment. And now it takes two lines, a condition and a rule. So it's essentially if, then do this. So what is the if condition here? So here's the condition. If the HTTP host, that is the URL, Everything between HTTP colon slash slash, whatever, and then the first slash. So that is the HTTP host, the domain, the fully qualified domain name, the host name, whatever you want to call it, the stuff that constitutes the guts of the URL. If it equals, or rather, if it does not equal, bang means does not, it does not. If it does not equal www.mailinrouge.com, and actually I should be a little more careful here. Let me see, my font's a little too big to be usable. Technically, I need that there, just to be really anal. So if the HTTP host does not equal www.mailinrouge.com, what do I do? I execute the following line. All right, what's the following line? Let me zoom back out. So the following line says this rule. Go ahead and match the rest of the URL. So dot star just means grab the contents of everything after the slash, or rather after the HTTP host. The parentheses here say, you know what? Store those in a variable for me. Grab everything dot star that I might that might have been after the HTTP host because I want to reuse it and use it later. So where do I want to redirect the user to? Redirect them to HTTP colon slash slash www.mailinrouge.com slash dollar sign one and just infer what's inside of dollar sign one. Yeah, anything that was after the host in the actual URL, after the forward slash. So the effect of this is to allow me to take a one domain, foo.com, grab everything after the slash, and add it to foo.com to redirect all requests effectively from one domain to the other. And I can actually be much more powerful than this if, for instance, I just knew that there was, if I wanted to say, just do this temporarily. I could say, you know what, redirect those same contents to a subdirectory that I just so happen to call temp because I'm futzing around with things. You can do any kind of arbitrary rewriting. But there's some interesting syntactical details here. So the formatting that Apache decided to use for variables, for environment variables, is percent sign, curly brace, curly brace, and inside in all caps is the variable's name. How do you know what variables exist? I showed the URL for Apache's documentation before. It's in the documentation. There's a big list. It's about you know, maybe 20 or 30 variables long. Most of them you'll never care about, but this is a very useful one to use. Um, what does the caret sign mean after the bang, after the exclamation point here? Uh, so not end of line, but start of line. So this means literally match the whole host from the left all the way to the right, because unfortunately it's not another caret sign. What does the dollar sign mean? End of string. So this is a way of saying uh, expect a perfect match. If I did not have that character there, but instead I had just done this, 
Uh, oh, okay. I didn't even bother with the dollar sign, actually. I could have done this. Sorry. I was assuming that I hadn't. So if I just did this, you know, odds are 99% of the time it's going to be just fine. But the thing is, if I had, for some crazy reason, done crazy things in DNS, like supported, uh, let's say, uh, new www.mailinrouge.com. The thing I just wrote up without the caret sign would match this also, which may not be the behavior you intend. So it just allows you to control more tightly what part of the URL you're actually matching. So I did this. I probably should have done this, which means expect a perfect match. Now, frankly, the way DNS works probably would be just fine because there is no TLD that I know of called like you know, common wealth. Like, yes, that could be a potential match, but that doesn't work in DNS, so the requests are never going to get there anyway. So it's kind of moot anyway. But this just has to do with regular expressions. NC, anyone know what this might mean in square brackets? Yeah, so this is to ward off uh, things like certain family members of mine that all will remain unnamed that do things like this when they try to visit their son's homepage. Um, so you can. Uh, avoid issues of sense case sensitivity, which DNS doesn't care about, but the web server might actually. So you can check things like that. Uh, let's see. How about this? There's something a little familiar here. What is this R equals 301 mean? Do you think? Re uh, yeah, it actually doesn't. Good coincidence. It doesn't stand for redirect, but that's fine. Yeah, so the 301. Uh, so the R we can actually debate, but the 301 is the interesting part because we've seen that before. So that's the redirect code, the response code. So 301 was the moved permanently. There's another one called 302, which is moved temporarily. The difference being when a browser gets a 301 and realizes, oh, Google has moved to www.google.com, the browser should just remember that so as not to waste time and waste bytes in the future re-requesting the same google.com. Even if I, the human, lazily just type google.com, Google should remember, oh, that was permanent. Let me just go get the thing from my cache if I kept it around. So 301 does that. If I do 302, which you might want to do, that means the browser should do it this once, but don't make any assumptions about the next time. Now that's advantageous if you don't want to screw up like your search results listings. And I'm guilty of this too. I accident I was futzing around with a course website in the summer once, and I think I changed our domain name temporarily to like new.cs75.net. It was just convenient for me. And I did redirects with 301. Unfortunately, Google chose to spider our account at some point. And then when we started Googling ourselves, our URLs started appearing as new.cs75.net. Just looked a little stupid, but it also meant we now had to keep that domain alive so that requests from Google would actually reach us. So it was really just kind of an amateur mistake. Um, I should have done temporary redirects so that Google Spider would have realized, oh, follow them now, but don't record them for posterity. And eventually it fixed things. Um, but it was, it was a mistake. It was uh, a little embarrassing for a dynamic websites class. So, <laughs> other questions? Or that was, uh, questions? Uh, if it's not equal to, so it was the bang. So if I want it to be precisely equal to, if I want to go the other direction. So first, let me go back to uh, my original version. This is my original version. And to be anal, I could go and do this too, to be more precise. So this is the version that redirects which URL to which one, just to be clear. MailinRouge.com to www.mailinRouge.com. And I'm actually being a little loose. Technically, this does what I just said. This redirects MailinRouge.com to www.mailinRouge.com. You know, fine. We can sort of argue whether or not this is which is better. But the reality is, if I haven't made any other DNS entries, this is equivalent. Because what I'm saying here is, if it is not www.mailinRouge.com, make it so. So that means then I have flexibility in the future. If I want to have foo.mailinrouge.com, bar.mailinrouge.com, I can change it in DNS, and I don't have to remember to edit this file. So it really depends on what your goal is. Uh, the result here is the same. But how about as a little mental exercise, what change do I need to make to go the other direction? If I want to say if www.mailinrouge.com redirect to the non www version, what do I do? Sorry? Take out the not? OK. And now what? 
Yeah, so really, it's pretty simple, right? So now say, if the HTTP host matches www.mailinrouge.com redirect to this specific URL. Yeah? Uh, that's me being inconsistent. That's the correct version. So the dot in general in a regular expression means any character. Now, realistically, the odds of there being a host name called www.mailinrouge.com with no dot on the left is very slim, but it was just a typo on my part. It depend, you use the exclamation point depending on what logic you want to express. So in this case, I'm asking the question, if the URL is www.mailinrouge.com, redirect to mailinrouge.com. Previously, I wanted to ask essentially the opposite question. So I said this, if not equal to mailinrouge.com, redirect to mailinrouge.com. But that would be equivalent, logically, for most cases, to saying this. If equal to mailinrouge.com, redirect to www.mailinrouge.com. This is more narrowly defined. The one with the not would allow me to have any number of host names all redirecting to www.mailinrouge.com. So again, um, understand certainly the specifics here, but understand more importantly sort of the basic syntax, because then you can express most anything you want. And we're keeping things fairly simple here, in fact. Uh-huh. Uh, before this, let's see, this one here. So, OK. So just to burn this into brains properly, this is the way my file pedagogically should have been it's when, when we started the story. So the backslashes mean, is that true? Yes. The backslashes mean treat this dot as a literal dot, not as a regular expression dot, which means any character. So this is correct. So if, I mean, frankly, this was my own stupid little website, so it really didn't matter, but should have mattered for class. This is what I would have done in this case correctly. And so really, the only question now I would propose is how do we flip the behavior? And I propose that we can do this in a couple of ways, one of which is to say if the domain name doesn't not equal, but does equal, redirect from there, www.mailinrouge.com, to mailinrouge.com. Well, let's see this behavior. Let me go ahead and reset Safari and empty all of its possible caches. Let me go to HTTP mailinrouge.com slash enter. OK, I stayed there this time. Now let me go explicitly to www.mailinrouge.com. I'll zoom in, enter. OK, it works. Now let's just do something kind of silly. You know what? Uh, to hell with these people that are trying to visit my website. Let's send them there, uh, www.mailinrouge.com, enter. Much better website. So you can do anything. And this is actually useful information if you want to redirect from one domain to another or whatever your scenario might. Uh. Oh, this is kind of pretty. Here you go, dynamic website. You'll get into the habit, probably, right clicking a lot or control clicking, and you can see how people implemented this. So these guys apparently chose to implement it in Flash, for better or for worse. That's actually very pretty. OK, but very irrelevant. <laughs> All right. Um, so any questions about mod, mod rewrite is the name of the module that we've been demonstrating. And most any feature of Apache is generally called a module or mod. So this one's called mod rewrite for reference. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, which one? Uh, dot star. This, by definition, captures everything that was after the slash, so everything in the path of the URL. The parentheses say not only ca uh, match anything, but also uh, capture it in a variable called dollar sign $1. Yeah? No, it, it could be any. We could change it to HTTPS, for instance. Uh, you don't have to hard, well. Uh, you can't really do it very dynamically except to have multiple rules. So one of the things we do on the course's website, for instance, is this. We have a few links 
on CS75.net that we do want to have SSL protection for. Um, and the way we do this is by way of an HT access file. We have a little directive that says if the URL matches the bulletin board or grades or I think that or the login page, force the user to be redirected to HTTPS. And we do this by way of a different Apache variable. This one is percent curly brace HTTPS. And we check what the value of this variable is. So we have two rules. And one says if it equals HTTPS, go to this version of the URL, or if not, go to this version. Yeah, not really here because you couldn't capture just an S in this context very cleverly. You could use the dollar sign one anywhere you want. Yes, if that's the question. Correct. So could you uh, say, I don't know, dollar HTTP host? Would that be the syntax? No, uh, I'm... no, so the right way, and let me see if. Uh... Correct. Yeah, so the, the, the way to do this, to be honest, is check the value of a different variable altogether. And you can have multiple HTTP cond statements, or rather, multiple rewrite cond statements again and again, and they get anded together uh, by nature. So they go again, and, and, and until they hit the first rewrite rule. And incidentally, this L is relevant. This means this is the last relevant rule in this set of lines. So this means any subsequent rewrite rules or conditions should be treated as separate. Yeah. So technically, it needs the .com. Browsers have gotten somewhat user friendly, so that that is purely a browser thing. It is assuming I want .com. It's then realizing, oh, if I append mailinrouge.com, I then get redirected to www.mailinrouge.com. So a lot happens behind the scenes, and the same deal goes too. I'm I'm, I suspect that like uh, the very first browsers years ago, um, like Mosaic, you probably had to type HTTP colon slash slash. And only over time did people realize humans don't want to have to type that gratuitous stuff anymore. So a lot of this magic happens on the browser's part and even on the ISP's part these days. A lot of ISPs have been getting a lot of flack, at least in the geek community, for DNS hijacking where they will, if you make a typo and go to mailinrougefoo.com, rather than return to you a DNS, a server not found error, uh, they will send you to, here's a page of ads from Comcast. Why not click through one of these? And they do this. This popped up on my own cable modem recently. And you have to explicitly click an opt out link and type in like your account number or something annoying just to get out of this serp uh, service. And they do it just because they can. And it's kind of. It's kind of wrong. Like there are tools that rely on r negative responses coming back, not 100% positive responses to DNS queries. But ma that makes them money. Other questions? Yeah. Um, for HTTPS, do you need a dedicated IP? Uh, for yes, good question. And we'll we'll come back to this when we focus more on security. But yes, for HTTPS, you do in fact need a dedicated IP address which means virtual hosts break down. So this is the reason we don't give everyone the ability to have HTTPS URLs in the course, because we don't have 150 IP addresses. We just use one for ourselves. Yeah? No, that's different. So VMware ESX is an example of a virtual machine technology, completely different uh, than virtual host. Virtual host just means multiple websites, same IP address. Virtual machine means illusion of multiple computers on one physical computer. All right. So this is Apache. We have largely uh, editorial. Uh, we have largely administrative control over it on CS75.net. How can you at least get to know this stuff yourself? How can you develop on your own machine? We well, have a couple of a couple of approaches. One of which is to use this tool like this, Xamp, uh, which allows you to download all at once. Uh, uh, not Linux, but Apache, MySQL, PHP, and optionally Perl, all in one package. It installs it. Works relatively easily. And what this means is that. 
you will have a web server, a database server, and a bunch of other stuff on your local computer with which to do development. What we will also release at some point in the semester is a virtual machine, per your、uh, comment a moment ago, which will be your own copy of Linux that you can run in a window on your computer and will have done all the configuration for you.、Um, that's not something you necessarily want to run in a production environment in perpetuity.、Um, so I would certainly play with this because it's just another approach to the same problem,、uh, but realize that we will experiment with that this semester. But long story short, you can certainly just rely on CS75.net and the tricks you'll learn in the PDFs、uh, for projects and in sections and so forth. So realize you don't have to go figure this stuff out. It's just for those who want to, for whatever reason, develop on their own machine. Just totally fine. All right, so now let's do something in this context. Let's、uh, begin our discussion of PHP, which we'll continue to focus on entirely next week. So, forms are really all the websites we're going to do boil down to. This ability to get input from users either comes from the act of their clicking URLs and sending get strings, as we've seen and we'll continue to see, or filling out forms or clicking buttons, changing select menus, generally triggering get or post、uh, requests. Of web servers. So the basic building blocks, if you've made web pages before but perhaps haven't actually made anything dynamic, we're going to have the ability to make text fields like the thing up top,、uh, password fields, almost identical but little bullets、uh, go where text might otherwise go, hidden fields, if you want to send a value from browser to server and you don't want the user to see it, you don't want them to be able to easily change it, you can send it hidden. Uh, but that's not a security mechanism. Realize that there have been instances of poor implementations of like, e commerce websites where people send the prices of the items people are adding to their shopping cart in hidden HTML fields. So, hidden, yes, but not hidden from anyone with a modicum of technical savvy, because if you're putting the power of price setting in your users' hands, you're bound to be doing something stupid eventually. So, there have been, and I'm sure you can find instances if you Google around, of people buying like, whatever, a TV for like, a penny. Because they just change the HTTP request, which is so easy to do in any number of ways, one of which is with Firefox plugins, and of which, another of which would be through Telnet manually. There's just so many fun ways to、like、set your own prices if someone's doing that. So, this is, motive,、uh, this is useful knowledge for project one when you implement your own pizzeria's website, because、uh, you'll see that you're going to store the Prices and such server side, but client side, you'll only send in like unique IDs, something that uniquely identifies the product the user wants to buy, because then you'll do a sanity check on your database. Your XML file will see for the actual price. Checkboxes, you've, used, all these,、uh, you've used these before. We'll see how to do them in PHP. Radio buttons, which are mutually exclusive checkboxes essentially.、Uh, we also have drop down menus, select menus. Uh, and then text areas, which are sort of big、uh, square like things that you can put a whole bunch of text in. And that's essentially it. There's buttons, submit buttons, and things like that. But for the most part, these are the basic building blocks of most any dynamic website. And coupled with JavaScript, you can really do some neat things with it. So let's do one such neat thing. Let's try to implement, say, Google. All right, Google, fortunately, is a very simple interface. And tragically, it used to look like that. But fast forward a couple days, and they changed the look of their buttons. So now it looks a little fancier. But the HTML is still essentially the same. So let's see if we can't reverse engineer or re implement Google in an interesting way. So let me go ahead and let's see. Start by view,、uh, page source. OK, a y so that's a whole lot of complicated stuff. But let's see how much of this we can rip out. I know from class that these things here are all generally inside of an open bracket form element. s So let me at least just start with my friend, control,、uh, Command F. So open bracket form. So I'm up here on the top right at the moment. All right, and if this, if you've really, if you're Comfort level with HTML is like open bracket, body, close bracket. Like, don't be freaked out by something like this.、Um, this is Google, mind you, and most of this is JavaScript, it seems. All right, there it is. So, highlighted in yellow, look at all this junk that I really don't care about. Good. We've chopped, oh, wait, I got to use a different text editor. Let's use text edit. Paste this in. Let me go into plain text mode. I can't edit it in the Safari window. So, let me, same thing, different program. Open bracket form, there it is. Let me throw away more than half of Google. All right, so now let me look for what? I just want to start chipping away here. Yeah, so slash form. All right, there's really not much to Google at all. So here we go. There, I mean, frankly, it's kind of amazing. This is what their billion dollar empire boils down to. All right, so if only we had thought of it first. 
Damn, they used the table tag. All right. So it's a little messy. Let me see if I can increase font size. So it's still a little confusing, but let's just throw away stuff that's just a distraction. So the table they're using is just for layout, which is commonly the case. There's some religious debates over whether or not this is smart. Um, but frankly, in reality, it tends to be the most reliable way still to lay things out in deterministic ways sometimes. I'm going to put these on new lines just to see it a little more clearly. I'm just skimming for anything that's actually form related and not markup or JavaScript. So I almost have my list here. Oh, look at that. There's that thing cost them, what, like a million dollars a day? We don't need the TDs, font size. Yeah, that's it. So this is, I mean, it, kind of amazing. This is Google. All right, so we have. Granted, there's a slash search, which they've implemented too, but we'll get there. So this is Google. This is what we boil down the essence of their home page to. So how can we go about re-implementing this? Well, let's see. So any form in a web page whose purpose in life is to actually submit that data has an action, uh, per, uh, an action attribute. This tells the browser to whom to send the uh, data inside this form. So slash search is where it's going to get sent. The slash is relative to the URL, to the domain name. So this means submit it to http colon slash slash www.google.com slash search. Now it's not search.php, it's not search.asp. Who knows what it's implemented in? May very well be a little Python script for the front end, but um, doesn't matter because that's still a URL. That's sort of their intellectual property there. Could be anything. Now the name here is actually not interesting because that was probably used for JavaScript. So I'm just going to get rid of that too. Notice Google is somewhat lazy when it comes to whoops putting things in quotes. They're clearly not using XHTML. Um, they're kind of using a particularly sloppy version of HTML. But frankly. You know, that's probably several thousand dollars a day just to put in that quote mark. So all the better if they can get rid of it at their volume. So let's get rid of it uh, so it's not a distraction. Here too, they're skimping on quotes. So let's see, input name equals HL hidden. Ugh, I don't know what that is. Let's just get rid of it. Source, this is also hidden. Ugh, I've never seen that before. Let's get rid of that. All right, autocomplete, bit of a distraction, max length. So this is just one way that they're trying to impose restrictions. This is client side. It means someone can still submit billions of characters to their web server just to mess around. But this is at least discouraging the browser from doing that, or a malicious or bored or clueless user from pasting in thousands of characters from their clipboard, perhaps. But this is the juicy part. I mean, this is the secret sauce of Google's front end. Q. Like that is the query. So that's the per name of the HTTP parameter that they want submitted <coughs> to Google's search engine. Size just says how big should it be. This is just aesthetics here. So there's really not much going on there except that. All right, then there's this, the button. So input type equals submit makes it a button. The value puts the label on that button. And then there's some CSS stuff there. And then the I'm feeling lucky button. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy this, the essence of Google. I'm going to go ahead to, let's say, Malin Rouge here. I'm going to create a file called google.html. Um, I never quite remember, frankly, even uh, these days, how to make an XHTML web page. So I usually go to some other web page that I've made, and then I view the source. And then I go like this. And then I go back to my code. And then I, yet again, avoid having to memorize it. So now I have the essence of an XHTML page. I'll go ahead and set up some basic structure here, body, close body. And then close HTML. Why XHTML? Um, just because, really, in this case. We're doing something simple, but I'll try to practice what we preach. I'm going to go ahead and put in a title. Uh, we'll call this Fake Google Ti uh, Title. And now I need a body. Let me go ahead and just paste in Google stuff, and then I'll clean it up. All right, so just to be a little anal, but also to make it more clearly readable. Uh, whoops. I'll do this. And you know what? If we really want to one up Google, right? Let's incentivize people to come to our site by really cleaning it up and making it really efficient. Let's see, we don't need that. Really don't need any of that. Let's make it well formed. So now I've actually made a better version of Google than Google did. It can be really anal here. None of these will have any material effect, as we shall see. But notice I'm also leaving a space here. This is decreasingly necessary these days, but for empty XHTML elements, folks still, at least myself included, get into the habit of um, using a space. And I'm sorry that the screen is a little washed out. Let's see if we can fix that a little. 
Um, people still use a space toward the end of the tag there in hopes of just avoiding confusing slightly older browsers. These days, it's probably really not necessary. Yep. Uh, close the form. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. I must have missed that or deleted it. Let me go ahead and remove this. Input type equals. OK, and that's really all we need. So now I have a very basic HTML form. Let me go ahead and save. This is google.html. Let me go to malinrouge.com slash google. We'll get a little bit of everything tonight. Now we got the course. <laughs> all right. OK, problem. There's that 404, right? So what did I do wrong? Oh, this is actually this is misleading. It is forbidden. This is a 403 per the title here. But uh, I really screwed up my website because it's supposed to be automatically looking for a default error page. And I also deleted the error page, which means first you're getting a 403, then you're getting a 404 because it can't find the error page for the first error. Uh, it's all fixable. It's just I've been butchering this account. So why is it forbidden? What did I do wrong? What, uh, yeah, chmod. So I need to give it global permissions. Uh, so I need to chmod 644. So this is stuff too you can pick up in sections, certainly on the bulletin board or in direct admin. There's a files icon when you log in. You can upload all files this semester via a web based GUI. So you don't have to get that comfortable with the command line except to submit. But if I hit enter, Nothing seems to happen, but if I go back here and reload, in fact, I do have Google. It doesn't quite look like Google, so let's try to fancy this up a little bit. So let me open my file again. This is an easy fix. Let's just put a line break there. OK, pretty good. I'm going to be a little more anal. Div align equals center, shall we say? And then a little into this, 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 this. And now close div. We're getting closer to Google. Yes, pretty good. All right, now let's try to, uh, let's see, fake Google with a little h1 action there. Oh, newbie mistake. OK, so it's not bad, right? That's maybe what it was like kind of 10 years ago, although it was, it's still a little prettier then. All right, so unfortunately it's still broken though, because let me go ahead and search for something. So, uh, monkeys. And, oh, that's not how you spell monkeys, is it? <laughs> <laughs> that's embarrassing. All right. <laughs> can't take it back when it's on camera and you really <laughs> okay so not found so i clearly forgot to do something what did i forget to do okay. yeah so i kind of forgot to implement the back end of google right so as much as how as how as easy as it might seem to re-implement google there is some secret sauce there so all right let me let me kind of cut corners Right, I can still fix this, hopefully. Let me go ahead and say HTTP colon slash slash www.google.com. And then, you know what, let me also be specific. XHTML requires this. So I'm actually going to say method equals quote unquote get. Somewhat confusingly, in the XHTML spec, it's lowercase get, even though we always write it as capital get. So just realize the dichotomy. Let me uh, save. Let me type uh, monkeys Google search. What's wrong? Yes, good. So newbie mistake, but very common. Certainly the kind of thing you can waste hours on late at night if you're not uh, totally conscious. Let me reload. Nothing seems to have changed, but hopefully my source code has. If I search for monkeys, enter. Oh, so now I actually have, that's a tiny little monkey. Well, a lot of useless information here tonight in Computer Science E75. So now I've re-implemented Google, and they seem to accept requests from my page. That's kind of interesting. Let me just get a little. A uh, little clever. I'm going to try changing to post just so I don't show the world in the URL what you're searching for, monkeys. OK, so in fact, Google, for whatever technical reason, just decided we're not going to support post whatsoever. So they turned it off. This is very relatively uncommon, I would say. Most people don't bother, but they just choose not to. So method not allowed. And actually, this is, I believe, the original Google logo. They still use it in their rare error messages on the screen. You can tell how kind of ugly the font is here. Uh, it's like font size equals quote unquote seven or whatever it once was. All right, so not bad. And if you actually really, uh, logo generator, if you really want to waste time in the middle of the night, you can do things like this. And let's say fake Google. 
And we could now download this. We can embed this in our page. Right? I, I won't go we've, between monkeys and Disney World. I think I've pushed the limit enough. But realize that you can do some fun things even with that font there. So what's the sort of interesting takeaway? Well, one, implementing a dynamic website seems to have two parts. One is the client side. One is the, the two is the server side. We clearly have punted on the server side. So let's see if we can now fill in that blank using a bit of PHP. All right. So PHP. Is a scripting, a, uh, an interpreted language. So, what does that mean? There's no explicit compilation step, which means you're not going to click a compile button, you're not going to run GCC, you're not going to run Visual Studio on the thing. You're just going to write your English like PHP code, put it on the server, name it something.php, and the server, upon receiving a request, not unlike this, is going to realize, oh, this file ends in .php. Rather than just return the contents of the file to the user, thereby disclosing all of their hard work and intellectual property, let me execute it or interpret it, then send the results of execution. So, what this means is when we start writing .php files, inside of there are going to be some kind of statements that say, spit out a bold tag, spit out this text, spit out an HTML tag. In other words, we're going to start dynamically generating our tags and our content. The fact that I've just put this up here is actually a hugely useful thing. So, one of the best things about PHP, hands down, honestly, is its documentation. I would personally say it's probably the best of any modern language I've seen. They have so many nice examples. It's all standardized. It's way better than Javadoc, even, which, because Javadoc is so damn overwhelming with all of the classes that ship with the JRE.、Uh, so, this is a wonderful thing. And just to remind you, since I think we had a little teaser the other day, if I search for Something like、uh, file get contents. This is a PHP function. Google very often leads you to the right page, I'll say, more so,、uh, even easier than using their own.、Uh, it might look a little confusing at first glance, but you'll find that it's all very、uh, structured. So, this、uh, function, it tells you in what version of PHP it exists since, since there is essentially version PHP 4, which was popular and around for a while. You can still find it on web hosts, but you should probably avoid it. It really lacks a lot of very useful and、uh, robust features these days. We have PHP 5.2, I believe, on the server. There is now PHP 5.3, which we've intentionally not installed on CS75.net because a lot of open source packages have just broken with it because they've really changed things around. So just realize that 5.2 is probably the sweet spot these days, or 5.1 when you're shopping around. Well, what is this function? And、this apparently is a function that returns a string, takes a few arguments, but frankly, even I usually fast forward to the examples and I, I realize, oh, so if I want to use file get contents, it looks like I declare a variable, as we'll see, called dollar sign homepage,、uh, assign it with the assignment operator, file get contents. Turns out file get contents, despite the name, can get the contents of an entire web page、uh, just by passing in the URL and then you can spit out the web page in that way. So PHP really comes with the kitchen sink and just makes it so easy to get. Uh, useful work done. So, you'll find the manual itself to actually be a wonderful learning tool. So, what accompanies PHP? On the server, we are using SU PHP, substitute user PHP. And this is to resolve some security concerns and some logistical ones. So, back in the day, you may recall that most web servers ran as username root. Or nobody, or Apache, or www, or web, or any of these sort of generic accounts. That's fine, but the problem is if you have multiple users on the system, all of whom want to not just host content like static HTML pages, but dynamic content like PHP, there's two problems. One, you can force users to chmod all their files like 644, which just means world readable. Which means anyone with an account on the system can look at those files if they want. This might rub you the wrong way because you spent a lot of time writing this code. It's your intellectual property. You don't want people seeing it so easily. Two, you can run into security concerns because if everyone's code is running as the same user, whether it's Apache, www, nobody, that means I, a malicious or just nosy user, could write a script that when accessed from the website, Actually, like searches through everyone else's accounts and then emails me the contents of all of their files. And that would just be the logical result of giving my code the permissions that everyone else has in some sense. So that too is kind of a problem. Running things as root avoids some of the privacy concerns, but means if I write code that's buggy, 
um, or malicious, I can really wreak havoc on the system. So that's even worse. So SUPHP is a really nice solution. What, and uh, what it does is it says any code in this directory gets executed by a specific user. So when we looked at this file earlier and we saw mention of the SU exec group uh, Malin, Malin, that means all of the MalinRouge.com domain's code gets executed as username Malin. Which means if user Malin does something malicious or stupid, like accidentally erases all of his files, the only files he's going to be able technically to erase are his own. And this is a good thing. And it also means more positively, if I'm making like a Flickr-like website allowing users to upload files, when those files get uploaded and saved in my home directory, they'll be owned by me, which means only I have the right to then look at those files and do things with them much better than uploading files. And back in the day, this would happen all the time, your users upload files, they get saved under user ID nobody, which means either one, anyone can see them, or two, you can't delete them. And that's even worse. Um, so. This is a very nice solution that's relatively easy to install on a web server. So um, for those who, who like to sort of learn things just by reading as opposed to uh, by, say, experimentation, realize that PHP does have a really nice language reference, which essentially walks you through all the basic building blocks of the language. Um, I would say this would be uh, even, uh, very easily skimmed by anyone comfortable with Java, C, PH, uh, Java, C, C++, uh, Perl, any sort of high level uh, imperative language. Um, and it'll dare say get boring quickly because you're just going to be reading about the syntax of a while loop or a for loop. But frankly, just to sit down for like, you know, while eating a snack, um, skimming through it, for those coming at the course with more background, we'll probably just find it a very easy way to acclimate to the slight syntactical differences with some languages. Those of you who have less experience in the course might actually really benefit and enjoy reading through it because it's relatively simple material but very clearly presented topic by topic. And so that URL is here in tonight's slides. Um, just to get some, some basic foundation in place for next week then, variables are not strongly typed which means you don't say char, you don't say int, you don't say double, you don't say float like you do in some languages. You just say dollar sign variable name. Now there are, uh, there's a notion of loosely typed variables, which means variables do have types, which is useful in some contexts as we'll see. But for the most part, there's a whole lot of automatic conversion. So if you, this is useful in a web context because any u input a user provides by nature of this stuff is coming at you as text. Right, it's being sent by HTTP. It literally is characters. Doesn't matter if those characters are one, two, three. That is a string. It is not an integer coming across the wire. So in that sense, it's kind of nice that PHP isn't so anal about strong typing in this sense. But we'll also see that um, um, it's not necessarily as uh, secure or as well, uh, well designed a language. And in fact, I would say right now, learning PHP, it's definitely mature, but it definitely lacks some really useful features that are really annoying that it doesn't have, like namespaces, if you're familiar with the idea, or packages. So you'll see, even in the course in your own projects, it's very easy to write code that kind of feels a little sloppy. And I would say that's really the nature of the language. You can absolutely write really well-designed PHP code. You can have classes. It is object-oriented as of version 5 and such. So you can write sort of enterprise-level code. But frankly, one of the beauties of PHP, in my experience and estimation, is it makes it so easy to do useful things quickly. So I think there's a trade-off, frankly, between how clean you write your code and how really well organized you make it, like a Java project might be, versus how long it takes you just to get something basic up and running. So just realize that, that uh, it has its pluses and minuses. And it does have some types, um, or, and we'll see these over time, especially in the documentation. They're pretty much what you would expect. So here's a little laundry list of types. I'll make mention of a couple um, mixed is something you'll actually see, which is kind of weird, because a function in PHP can return a bool or an int or a float or a string even in one function. It can return different things. So this PHP we'll see, and again, we'll see this by way of example, PHP has not only the assignment operator or the equality operator, but also the equality and identity operator, which checks the type as well as the value of a variable. So we'll see that over time. Um, and yeah, let's see. So this too is just another reference. Let me just let us glance at it real fast. This guy here is not just about um, 
uh, syntactic details of the language, but about PHP references. So when we use this dollar sign notation, there uh, you'll see over time, and this is slightly more sophisticated. So this is meant sort of as the advanced reading. You didn't, you didn't sink your teeth really into this just yet. You can pass things around by references, which aren't quite pointers. They're references in like a C++ sense or in a Java sense uh, for efficiency's sake. So realize there are some neat language constructs in there. But I would say for those less comfortable in the material, don't worry so much about recommended reading like this. But what is useful for today is to point out some of the really neat and powerful features of PHP that we'll be making significant use of. So in PHP, when you just start writing a foo.php file, first of all, if it's not been implicitly clear already, any PHP file has to start with open bracket, question mark, PHP, and end with uh, question mark, close bracket. Now that's a slight white lie because you can very easily in a config file, which for our laundry list of keywords today, is generally called php.ini. This is sort of PHP's equivalent of http.conf for itself. You can turn on what are called short tags and just write code that looks like this. Um, and this, just like ASP has this idea, JSP has this idea, Anything in a file that begins with this and ends with this will be executed. Anything outside of this will just be spit out literally. And we'll see what this means in just a moment with a little demonstration. Uh, as a rule of thumb, if you're ever going to write PHP code that other humans need to use, you're writing a library, you're writing a project with other people, go the more verbose route because it means they don't have to change their web server to run your code. But anytime I'm writing code that's only for my use, I think this is ugly uh, and just an unnecessary waste of characters. And so I go this approach. So just realize if it's for yourself, do whatever you want. For other people, do it the right way. Uh, so PHP has this notion of super global. So PHP does have global variables, but we'll see they're not really global. It's kind of annoying to use them. But so super globals are what most in this room would think of as global variables. They're all capitalized, spells precisely like this, with the underscore. And inside of these super globals, do you get some very useful information handed to you on a platter, so to speak, including any variables that were submitted from a form via get, dollar sign underscore get, any variables, parameters that were submitted to you via post, dollar sign underscore post, you get both of those together in dollar sign underscore request, including cookies, which are also put in dollar sign underscore cookie. Right, there's a pattern here. And this just means you get very easy access to the data you ultimately care about. This was a much bigger pain in something like Perl early on. And God forbid C or C++ when you really had to implement the parser of strings like this yourself. So PHP handles all of this nuisance and just hands you the variables you care about. Um, other ones we'll see eventually, especially at final projects, that you might use files. If the user has a bunch of those browse buttons and uploads a bunch of files, they get handed to you in an array called files. Session is going to be hugely powerful when we start implementing things like shopping carts or just maintaining state. It's a hugely useful thing. And then you've got things like dollar sign underscore uh, server, which have got a lot of environment variables and metadata that is often uh, useful as well. So a quick example then of this. Let me go ahead and re-implement my own version of Google Search. I'm going to call it search.php. Uh, which apparently uh, did previously. So here I'm going to have pretty much the same setup as before, a very basic page. So I'm going to call this again fake Google. And let me just do this. So hello world. So this is a file called search.php, but there's none of those things in it just yet. So realize that very often, although you can move away from this sort of uh, intermingled approach, very often you're, are you going to commingle HTML or XHTML and PHP? Here I've done that, it's just I've used no PHP yet. So let me go into google.html, change this URL to not be google.com, but rather what? Search.php. OK, so search.php. Let me go back to my browser here, fake Google. I reloaded. Let me go ahead now and search for monkeys, Google search. OK, not very helpful, but clearly I've gone to the right place. So let's now take a step back. Let me go back into search.php. Whoops, left off the file extension, search.php. And let me do this. I've already know from a moment ago that inside of dollar sign underscore get are all of my variables. So let me see that. You know what? Let me do something like uh, open bracket question mark, 
and then uh, question mark close bracket. I'm going to go on a limb here and say that there's a print function. And I want to print the contents of get. Get on all these superglobals are actually uh, arrays, associative arrays, aka hash tables. Uh, so I'm going to go and say, quote unquote, what was the parameter I submitted? Q. Yeah, so Q, close quote. I could use single quotes there or double. But the point is I'm calling a function called print. I'm passing in a parameter. What's that parameter? It's the value of the key called Q in the array um, dollar sign underscore get. And I'll incidentally try to fix the colors for next time because it's still washed out with the lights down. Uh, let's go ahead now and let's save that. Let's go back to the browser. Let's go back here. Reload. Monkeys. Google search. Hmm. What's the problem? It's actually a good debugging session. What's wrong? Good. So remember, one of the last things we did earlier was change it to post. Just to kind of mess around with Google, you can confirm as much. Because even though I click Submit, notice what is not in the URL, any of the parameters, which means they were sent sort of behind the scenes, which is what post does. So actually, let's see. So I could fix this in a couple of ways. I could change it server side. Whoops. Post, and let's see if that, in fact, is consistent with the uh, diagnosis. Reload. Yeah, there it is. It was inside of post. Let me be uh, stubborn and leave it as get. Let me go back into google.html and change my method back to get. And go back to the form, reload, type in monkeys, Google search. OK, so now that works as well. Just a little sanity check now. Uh, let's say I had another variable here. Let's do something like this. Uh, let's say input type equals checkbox, name equals random, and value equals yes, and then click me for random. So I'm just coming up with something completely arbitrary just so I have a new thing. So let me type in monkeys here, click the checkbox here, click Google search, OK, I haven't revealed the contents, but notice in the URL what's happening. The browser did this whole encoding of the ampersand separating the parameters and values for me. So this is actually very nice that it's consistent. How can I get at that value? Well, let's see. Let me go back into search.php. All right, so let me print out not only that, but you know what? Let's see. I don't know how best to do this yet. So let me get a little. A little sloppy, and let me just print out a br because if it prints, then it's spitting out correct HTML. Let me, oops, let me print out the value of random, and let me reload. Okay, there it is. The value of random is yes. Now, just to show you again, tonight we're really just playing with syntax. Let me bring this up onto a line just to show you a trick that you know you can also do. Feels a little sloppy to be printing out what's essentially static content, so we could drop back into static or raw XHTML mode, and now do something like this. And again, this is speaking to the general approach that we're going to really climax with them here uh, tonight in lecture. <laughs> so we can speak, do something very similar. And this is feeling kind of clean, right? Like sort of drop into PHP, HTML mode, PHP mode, HTML mode. So it's a pretty common approach. You pay a slight performance penalty maybe going in and out of modes here. But for what we're doing here, certainly irrelevant. If I reload, it's actually the same thing. So that's interesting. And I'll also say, especially as you're learning early on, I'd kind of like to see what's inside this whole array. So I, this is not production code now. I'm going to use this very ugly pre-formatted pre text. And I'm going to say print r recursively the contents of everything in get. And this is just going to show me, just for diagnostic purposes, and I to this day do this all the time just to see what's inside. Notice that what I have inside is apparently a data type that's of type, a, a variable of type array. And it's got two keys, q and random, and their values are monkey and yes. And this just helps me see what's going on. In fact, it might be more interesting to see what's going on inside of one of the other super globals, like server. Let me reload this. Wow, there's a lot of stuff inside of here. Well, what is here? So let's see. Uh, I have request URI, a reminder of what the user searched for. I have the IP address of the remote user. There's that default email address. So there's just a lot of server-specific and request-specific information that came in across the wire. So what else are, does PHP have? It has arrays. And 
Uh, someone once said that if you're going to have just one data, uh, data structure in your toolkit, sort of a hash table or an associative array is the one you'd want because it's so versatile. And that's precisely what all of these super globals are. An array in PHP can be numerically indexed. You can have bracket 0, bracket 1, and all of that. Or you can put arbitrary strings in there, just as these, have, these super globals have been using. And we'll see that is quite useful. PHP has loops. The syntax is pretty familiar, except where you declare variables, you use dollar signs before them. But it's four, a parenthesis, close parenthesis, a couple semicolons in there. Familiar syntax to many of you, probably. While loops got do while for each loops is actually really interesting, too. We'll see more of that in the, in the weeks to come. So you have what ultimately are very basic, familiar language constructs for many of you, not all of you. Um, and what we'll do next week is dive in and start implementing some more interesting programs. We'll release the next project, and you'll be on your way building dynamic websites. See you next week.